Welcome everyone to our latest recap of House of the Dragon. We are at episode six. Apologies for the belated review. I normally have these up by Monday, but I'm in the process of moving to a new location. So this review is a little late, but as of course, there's a lot to cover. And if you enjoy the video, make sure to like and subscribe. We're at episode six entitled The Princess and the Queen. And that of course means that Rhaenyra and Allison are kind of our main characters for this episode a lot of the the movements and the occurrences that happen here are really tied to the friction that we've seen between the former friends now the big thing about this episode is this is our big time jump you know the actors that we fell in love with the first five episodes are now gone so now we have an adult Allison and an adult Rhaenyra and I think they did a really good job starting out and you can kind of feel the weight that has been on both of them the last 10 years. Starting out with Rhaenyra, the first image we see of her in the episode is in childbirth. She's in pain, they, you know, her face is ha haggard, her hair is haggard. And who does she look like? She looks exactly like her mother, Emma. But unlike her mother that died in childbirth, Rhaenyra is kind of having to carry the weight of all of her actions, you know, literally and figuratively. You know, with this latest child, we find out that because of the arrangement she has with her husband, Lenor, all these children have been birthed by Sir Harwin, who is Lionel's son, you know, the hand's son, and also the head of the city watch. So this threw me for a loop from the beginning because I assume when they made this agreement, her and Rhaenyra, the agreement was going to be, yeah, you do what you want, but at least the children, we're going to do our duty as we're going to at least consummate that to make sure the children have our blood. I didn't know that they weren't going to touch each other, period. You know, we know in modern times, you have plenty of uh, gay men that have been in down low marriages and still had children to keep up the facade. So I at least thought they were going to do that. That would make things less complicated, but nope. You know, they've had no contact whatsoever. Lenor has his lover, Sir Qual. And Rhaenyra has been, she's had three children by Harwin, which was insane to think about. And, you know, Allison is actually of the same vein with that, because when she goes to Viserys, uh, who has his head in the sand about this whole arrangement, she tells him that one child, you know, that can be an accident or a mistake or a dis uh, discretion, but three is an insult. And I'm tired of putting up with it. And this is an abomination to the court and an affront to you. And Viserys is pretty much like, you know, he gives her this, you know, ridiculous uh, story about a mare with different features that he used to have under his uh, care in the stable and how nature is mysterious and you can never know, you know, how genes are going to turn out. And he essentially tells her that, you know, don't speak of this again. So that lets Allison know that this man in his final years is going to continue to keep his head in the sand and continue to ignore the upcoming war because you can feel the war is coming. And, you know, these tensions are going to eventually boil over and he doesn't want any part of it. You know, in his older age, he doesn't want to deal with any type of strife. You know, you can argue that all the strife he's been dealing with for the last, you know, since he's been king uh, with Damon, with the war on the Stepstones, with the issues with his wife, you know, losing his original wife, Ama, all that has kind of contributed to the condition that he's in now. So he doesn't want any part of that. So Allison is now going to have to try and rely on other people to get what she wants. You know, she's been confiding in Sir Criston Cole, who was still angry 10 years later at Rhaenyra for rebuffing his marriage proposal, calls the woman a spoiled cunt, compares her to a spider, you know, he's still all in his feelings. So we know that revenge is on his mind and any way that he can get back at Rhaenyra, he's going to do so. And the big thing about this is that I kind of wish we didn't get the time jump because I really wanted to see the aftermath and they didn't touch on this. So I feel this was kind of a weakness for the show. You know, I talked about this in the last recap, you know, Kristan, he punched Lenor in the wedding you know, when he was in the process of beating Lenore's lover to death. So the fact that he laid his hand on the, uh, on Rhaenyra's future husband, you would think that would have some repercussions and everything with House Valerian 
the fact that that happened in the wedding, but we don't get any of that touched on, you know, so I feel I really wanted to see what the immediate fallout would be from that and how Kristan would be able to remain in the court. So the only kind of hints about that we get about that is really when you look at the maids, the maids, when they're around, you know, Allison, pretty much any of the high-end people, you can just tell on their faces that they're like, this is a shit show. So they kind of, you know, if anybody, they know what's going on. So that's the only kind of hint that we have that they've been keenly eavesdropping on all this nonsense that's been going on the last 10 years since we had the marriage of uh, Rhaenyra and Lenor. But one thing I wanted to focus on first, as far as between Rhaenyra and Allison. Which is worse, Allison's self-righteousness and her delusion or Rhaenyra's stupidity? Now, let me start with Allison. You know, the biggest thing that I think people hate about her or some people hate about her is how self-righteous she is and how she kind of doesn't look at her own fault. She really feels like everything that she's doing is in the best interest of truth and purity when it's not. You know, a lot of it is resentment due to the fact that she never really wanted this position and she was pushed into it literally by her father. And then number two, there's a big undercurrent of jealousy, I feel, that she has for Rhaenyra. You know, of course, she feels that Rhaenyra is reckless in what she's been doing and all that is true. But I feel like the things that Rhaenyra does, secretly Allison wishes she has that same autonomy. You know, Rhaenyra completely controls her sexuality. Uh, she kind of still is a free spirit and kind of does what she wants to do, even in the confines of the crown. And I think that Allison really resents that because she feels like I'm sacrificing all this. I've lost all my friends. I don't have any friends. I'm sleeping with this older man. It's literally falling apart and decaying that I have no uh, true passion for. I've been doing that and making all these sacrifices in order to uphold my duty, quote unquote. And nobody around me seems to be doing that but me. And so because she feels that way, I feel like everything that she's kind of been doing is to live up to that standard that she feels she's the only one that can uphold. But she has to realize or she eventually will realize that everything that she's doing is underhanded. It's uh, a lot of backstabbing and it flies in the face of this righteousness she claims to uphold. So until she makes peace with that, and I feel like she kind of was forced into it, we'll touch on that later on with Lares, she'll continually have this um, delusional self-righteousness that I feel is her biggest weakness. Now, on the other hand, with Rhaenyra, when I talked about stupidity, as much as I like her, as much as I really was rooting for the younger Rhaenyra, it feels like nothing has changed and the stakes are higher now. And I felt like in the last couple episodes where she had that big talk with um, Viserys when he's basically telling her, you need to do what you have to do and you're not a child anymore, I figured that would be her wake up call. But here she is as an adult making bigger mistakes that are going to have a bigger impact on how the rest of the season turns out. Now, what do I mean by stupidity? Number one, you know, as a woman that's going to inherit the throne, the first woman, there's going to be a lot on you. You know, there's going to be a lot of naysayers. There's going to be people just waiting for any type of um, scandal or weakness to challenge your claim to the throne. So the worst thing that you can possibly do is have not one, not two, but three bastard children. And the person that you select to have these children is who? the hand's son, Sir Harwin. Now, I know the ladies have been going crazy about Sir Harwin and everything, but this was a bad, bad idea. Three kids, three kids that look nothing like their father. And that was kind of the inside joke at the beginning when um, uh, Viserys was saying, oh, you know, this latest child has his father's nose. And, but come on. You know, no hint of anything. I mean, I know the racial structure and all that doesn't really seem to have much of an impact back, <laughs> back at this time. But you should know them children have no resemblance to the uh, Valerian line whatsoever. And of course, the court has been um, speculating about this. You know, even Damon all the way over across the sea in Pentos, he knows about the rumors. So Allison really put herself in a bad position doing this. This was a horrible idea. And she's finally starting to realize the repercussions of this. Number one, she's having the baby. She doesn't have any time to relax and recover because the queen wants to see the child. And the only reason she's saying that is because Allison wants to pull a power play and remind 
uh, Rhaenyra of her position. That's the only reason she did that. So she's literally walking around the court bleeding, like bleeding through the halls and everything. You know, that's how bad of a shape that she's in. And you know that's wearing on her mentally. She's having no break. And here's another key thing that we're seeing. We're seeing how lopsided these marriages are as far as the responsibilities. You kind of hear that these days on social media. You're starting to hear a lot of women complaining about their husbands not pulling the, the full weight when it comes to child rearing or even in the house, you know, as far as helping clean and things like that. We're seeing that on a bigger level here. Because while Rhaenyra is struggling and trying to be adjusted to new motherhood, what is Lenor doing? He's living it up with his um his side piece, having a good old time drinking throughout Flea's bottom. And it's funny, it's like now Rhaenyra is looking at him like, this is not what we agreed to. I said, yes, you can do what you want, but you know, you need to step up also as a father. And Lenor is looking at her like she's crazy. It's like, We've been doing this for 10 years and now you're bringing this up. And that kind of ties into people treat you the way you let them. You know, as far as this arrangement, the particulars, I guess, were never laid out as far as how is this going to work with childbearing? How is this going to work with helping to raise the kids and all that? Lenor has been able to kind of have his hands free for the entire 10 years for the most part, which was not a good idea because she really needed him in the trenches with her when it comes to combating Allison. And it seems like he's been doing none of that. So that puts her at a big disadvantage. On Allison's end, we see that, you know, the king is the opposite way. He kind of pulled rank on her when she was trying to complain about these children. To him, you know, all these bastard children, he tells her, don't speak about it anymore. So she's feeling powerless on her end. And back to Rhaenyra, she actually told Lenor that I'm commanding you to stay here. You're not going to go overseas to fight the tri triarchy again. I need you here to help you know, try and jump into this role. And I don't know if he's capable of handling the politics on the level that Rhaenyra needs him to, to kind of combat, combat everything that Allison is doing. And I think Rhaenyra finally realized that late. And that's why she tried to come with that proposal of marrying one of her children to one of Allison's children, or her only daughter, Helena, to try and solidify the, the, um, the um, bond between the houses. But Allison is not trying to hear that. She's on her self righteousness tip. You know, these are bastard children you have, Rhaenyra. I'm not having it. And it's a very, you feel bad for Rhaenyra because, you know, you can tell it's a desperate plea. And Allison realizes it immediately. That's why she has that great line about, you know, uh, how sweetly the fox speaks when cornered by hounds. And that kind of um, hints that she feels like she has Rhaenyra right where she wants her. And she's, going to put the pressure on higher now. But at the same time, the big roadblock is going to be Lionel is still the hand, and Viserys is still not going to go against her daughter. So while she's complain complaining to uh, Sir Kristen Cole, there's only so much he can do. He's in the King's Guard. And, you know, she even had to remind him when he kind of stepped out of his place and called the the queen to be a cunt. You know, she looked at him like, you know, don't step out of your place. You're still a knight, and you're still under her. So there's only so much he can do, but she does make the, ah, maybe it'll be a mistake in the future, but I like that she did this because it introduced us to our first kind of overt villain so far in the series and Lars. Lars Strong, the son of the Hand and the brother of Harwin. What makes him so dangerous to me is the fact that he's so unassuming. Remember the first time we saw him, he was in the court with the ladies, you know, laying there with the older ladies, just talking about gossip and everything. He was complete, completely removed from the political end and has no visible power whatsoever. So he's almost invisible. You know, no one really takes a second look at him. And that's what allows him to move all these, to do all these moves and to move all these chess pieces in the background. He's in the perfect position. And he totally kind of put a checkmate on Allison. You know, her sitting there, when you're venting like that, you got to watch who you're venting to. She basically laid out all of her grievances and where her weakest point is. And he was able to shore all, himself, shore all that up and put himself in the winning position where she can't out him because if she does that, she basically ruins herself as well. So he's in the perfect position by the fact that now all he had to do to get in this perfect position was arrange the murder of his father and his brother. But as he told, and you know, his ending speech, 
which um, I like to hear what you guys think about that speech. I'm going to call it the love is a downfall speech. Compare that to Littlefinger's chaos is a ladder speech. Which one do you think is better? Because that one really hit. I'm talking about uh, Laris's speech because he laid out, he took away his one weakness. His one weakness that we know so far would have, would have been his family. You know, they were the only ones that could potentially see who he truly is. But by arranging that fire, Harwin is gone. The king is weakened now. And just as Laura told Allison, now that you're in this position, you can bring back in your father as you originally wanted. You said you wanted someone on your side. Well, here it is. Your father is back. And what I also liked about this is he really kind of shut Allison up and kind of put her feet to the fire. Because remember, the last episode with the wedding, she came in, she had her green on. The green is a symbol of war from her house. And she just didn't take it off. So she's essentially been wearing green and been in the war mode for the last 10 years. But you, but she's been pussyfooting around because I'm like, if you're really at war and like you claim, this would have been shored up in the last 10 years, but you've been doing little microaggressions and things like that. So you really haven't been about war. And Laris is like, if we're going to go to war, this is what war looks like. It requires making sacrifices. It requires being devious. It requires being underhanded. And it requires being ruthless. And he showed all of that. And he basically told her, for all of you HBO fans, as you've been watching HBO shows, you know, for the last decade or so, one of my favorites was Border, uh, Boardwalk Empire. And there's a line in there that one of the characters says to another character that has one foot on the political side and one foot on the gangster side. This show took place in, you know, the, the Prohibition era. He tells that character, you can't be half a gangster anymore. And that's essentially what Laura told Allison. You can't be one foot in one foot out. If we're going to go to war, this is what war looks like. And I'm going to be your general. I'm going to be right by your side and I'm going to make sure you succeed. But you can't be looking scared now about the tactics that we're going to use. Because if you claim this is life and death, you know, like your, your father Otto told you, this is the things that we're going to have to do to make sure that we win. So I'm loving Lara so far. You know, I wouldn't want to be his enemy. I'm it's going to take a lot for him to be exposed because he's so in the background. The only way I can possibly see him getting exposed is maybe from the maids because the maids are the only ones that are seeing him constantly with Allison. So that would be the next thing. If I'm Laura's, I'm making sure I pay them off so they don't go blabbing to anyone else. But he is in a fantastic position so far because right now, if anything comes out, the first person they're going to be looking at will be Allison instead of him. So the next thing I want to cover is all these kids, you know, we're going to get all the names down. We got Helena, who was, um, she seems almost like, I don't know, she's like a psychic or something. But when, you know, she was talking with her mother, Allison, she seemed very perceptive, particularly when her brother, Eamon, came in there complaining about his brothers um, mocking him for not having a dragon. It seemed like she was alluding to what he would need to do to succeed you know so it's almost like she has a third eye open i don't know if she's like a mystic or something but she's very very perceptive so i'm going to keep an eye on her we have another time jump to see what the adult version of her looks like because you know it seems like she doesn't really have any devious allegiances but she sees everything coming which is you know a good skill to have in the, the game of thrones universe now as far as aemon goes you know, all these Targaryen kids, you know, they all seem off. I don't really, I'm not really too fond of any of them. But Aemon is the one, if anyone, you're going to kind of root for because you don't want to see anybody get bullied. You know, he doesn't have a dragon. They're mocking him. They take out a, a pig that they dress up like a dragon and call it the Pink Dread. So his brothers have really been getting on his case. So that to me is going to fuel him. I can see him potentially becoming like another Damon type figure, like having that type of cavalier you know, F you attitude to everyone, including his family. So that's where I see his path going. Now, the king to be or uh, the heir, I think is, um, well, not the heir because Rhaenyra is the heir, but I guess the next in line would be Aegon if Allison is able to succeed and get her children on the throne. But Aegon is clearly not fit to rule. He's like the Frodo, uh, oh, excuse me, Fredo Corleone of the family. He's just hapless. You know, he's jerking off in the tower. You know, he's, he has no focus. You know, his downfall looks like it's going to be um, women. That's going to be his big issue. And Allison had to grab him and slap him up and basically tell him, your life is in danger if we don't succeed. And you notice the way she he uh, she grabs him. It's a parallel to, where, to the way Otto was holding her face 
in the last episode, but while Ala was more tender and trying to help his daughter wake up to the potential warfare that's going to come, Allison is more urgent and more um, angry at the fact that her son has showed no type of um, awareness about what may happen in the future. So she's trying to wake him up, but I don't think it's going to happen. I think that he's kind of like just cannon fodder. I don't see him lasting long. You know, when the eventual war happens, that looks like it's going to happen. He just doesn't seem like he's focused. It seems like Eamon is going to be the one to kind of carry the family name on the Allison side. As far as the children on Rhaenyra's side, everyone is still kind of young. They, they weren't really distinguishable at this point. So I don't know who's going to really have her back if we get another time jump. But um, on Allison's end, I mean, excuse me, on, on Rhaenyra's end, the other thing I'm interested to see is her reaction to losing her lover, Harwin, and losing the hand. So, you know, I know that she left to go to Dragonstone because she kind of realized that there's no way that Allison is going to make amends with her and she needed to get out of there, especially with all these rumors. And the main thing that kind of tipped her off is her eavesdropping on that conversation with Lionel and Harwin, where Lionel was chewing him out for getting into that fight with Kristen Cole in the courtyard, which kind of exacerbated the rumors that are going around about Rhaenyra's children and their true parentage. So now Rhaenyra knows that she has to get out of here. But as soon as she gets to Dragonstone, she's going to know Harwin is dead. And she has no allies in the in um in the Iron Throne now. So I'm wondering if that's going to make her decide, you know what, we need to raise because she mentioned something to Lenor about we need as many swords as we can get. So that in my mind makes me think that she's preparing for war now, that she knows that she needs to set up a base there and get as many people on her side as possible. So I'm wondering if that's going to make her Harwin's death kind of make the first move, so to speak. I don't know if that means ambushing somebody somewhere at King's Landing or maybe on the outskirts, but it looks like she knows that the war is about to come. Now on Allison's end and everything, now that Harwin is gone and all that, when Otto comes back, my I'm wondering how he's going to look at it. Is he going to say, we need to raise the banners now and get the army ready? Because I don't think he's going to be able to do that with the king still there. Because the king is not going to want any type of open warfare. Because he made this decision. Allison, I mean, Rhaenyra is going to be ascending the throne. And anything outside of that would be treason. So that means that Otto is still going to have to work in the shadows to try and raise up an army or have an army ready if he's even thinking like that. So what that tells me is that Rhaenyra might be able to get like a one up if she moves fast and maybe, you know, just maybe because it looks like there's some type of confrontation in the um in the throne room in the next preview. Maybe she takes her army right to King's Landing after she hears about Harwin's death. Maybe that lets her know right off the bat, I need to you know, storm King's Landing and, you know, take my crown. We'll see. Now, on Lionel's end, I do have to say I was completely wrong. I thought the fact that he had Harwin with him, I even said this in the last recap, I was confident that he was going to make it to the end of the season now because he had someone like Harwin in his corner to protect him in case there was any type of um, deception. And here we are an episode later, they both get burned to death. So <laughs> I was completely wrong, but I did say initially in the, in the other uh, recaps that he was the most in danger because he was the one that was the most kind-hearted. You know, he was the one that was really only there for the king and didn't have any ulterior motives. And the person like that is not going to survive in the treacherous environment that we have in um, House of the Dragon. So sorry to see them both go, but not exactly surprising. Uh, one thing I do want to mention about the kids, it feels like they're inheriting they're inheriting all of their parents' drama, and they're basically being being used as pawns right now. So you saw they were basically pawns in the struggle between Arwen and Kristan Cole about their parentage. We saw again how the kids were being used as pawns when Allison was chewing out Aegon about waking up and being prepared to eventually be king. And then, unfortunately, if we go over to across the sea and look at Damon, we have two other kids that are, are suffering under their parents with uh, Lena dying in childbirth. And we find out during their discussions uh, that Lena is mentioning to Damon that he doesn't really have much interaction with his daughters. He's been ignoring them. And now that Lena dies in childbirth, what's going to happen with those two daughters now? Because it seems like he has nothing left for him in Pentos. He was running away 
from any responsibilities over there now. But now that he's lost Lena, the only one that really wanted to go back, is he going to go back or is he going to just stay over there? Or, or maybe he decides to conquer the triarchy again and kind of raise an army over there. And then maybe he might be the one descending back to Westeros with his own army trying to claim the throne. So then we would have Damon's army, Rhaenyra's army, and then we have whatever army that Allison's people are going to uh, raise. So that's going to be interesting because I didn't think about it. You know, the fact that Harwin, I believe he's loyal to Damon, you know, the gold cloaks in the city. So with Harwin, uh, Harwin being killed like that, that might drive um, Damon into a rage as well to kind of want to come back and find out what happened to his friend. So a lot going on this episode. I was really impressed you know i was very worried beforehand about how the adult versions would go being that we got so attached to the kids but you can see everything in the mannerism you know adult allison is acting like how we expected her to do rhaenyra's acting is still impulsive and doing what she wants to do just like when she was a precocious kid so we're still seeing the same thing in rhaenyra the series is just older. Um, so I'm sure he looks like he's on death door, but he's hanging in there. So he's still the series that we knew. Lionel was still the same. You know, same actors in in that regard. But interesting to see them aging. But I'm really intrigued. Looks like episode seven is where the drama and the warfare really picks up. So I'm wondering these last couple episodes, are we going to get straight warfare for the end of the season? Very very interesting. But let me know what you guys think. Let me know if you're team Allison. Team Rhaenyra, Team Damon, or you just, you know, think they're all full of shit in their own type of way and just I'm not team anybody. You're just here looking for the spectacle. But we'll be back on Monday with our recap of episode seven. Like and subscribe if you enjoy the content. And we may do another video just kind of breaking down Lars a little bit more. Uh, I really liked his character so far, and I feel like he's going to be the guy that's really going to be moving all the pieces for the remainder of episode, excuse me, for the remainder of season one. So thank you for tuning in and I'll see you guys next week.